All right, guys, today we are going to do the calculation and the application of what we did yesterday. So just to recap what this section is allowing us to do is that we are taking two separate groups. Now they could be independent, meaning one is doing something and something else is doing the same thing and we'd be comparing those outcomes or one group is doing something and then we do something to it or for it and then we do the same thing again and compare the before and after. So that's the major difference between independent and dependent. But either way, we have two separate sets of, sets of data and we're gonna be comparing them. Now with this calculation here, this is the calculation for our confidence interval. So we're still gonna do confidence intervals, but this confidence interval is not going to represent a thought range to where the known mean will be found, which is what we did in previous sections. This confidence interval is going to say with a certain level of confidence, which population, if either one of them is better than the other one. Now I keep putting better in quotation marks because better could mean a lot of different things as we discussed earlier in the semester. For instance, if I were to talk about the mortality rate of COVID versus the flu, and I wanna know since I'm talking about the mortality rate, maybe I wanna know which one has the higher mortality rate. Well, is that a better thing? No, it's not, but that's what we're studying. If I wanted to know which has the lower mortality rate, now I've changed how I'm viewing the problem and now the better is the lower rate. So how we decide what is a good thing or a bad thing does not influence the better word that I keep using. Uh, so don't think that just because something has a negative outcome, that doesn't mean that it's not our better situation. So that's why the context of the problem is so important. Now to create this confidence interval, uh, again, we have three outcomes. We could have a positive number to a positive number. We could have a negative number to a negative number, or we could have a negative number to a positive number. Those are the only three outcomes that will occur. And based off of those outcomes, we will be able to construct a statement to describe what the confidence interval is telling us with a certain level of confidence. Uh, so just to break down what some of these variables mean, uh, X bar sub one is the first sample mean, X bar sub two is the second sample mean, and then we subtract the margin of error from that. Uh, and so we'll be going through how to calculate the margin of error and what we'll be doing uh, with that margin of error from um, there. And then we have the X bar sub one minus X bar sub two, uh, subtracting those, and then we add the margin of error to that. Uh, and so what that will give us is a lower bound and an upper bound of our confidence interval. And that will tell us that when we subtract the population means, which we don't know, but when we do theoretically find out what the population mean of one is versus the population mean of the other. And when we do subtract them, is the first population going to have a higher value? Is the second one gonna have a higher value? Statistically, can we not say? Uh, so that's what we will be calculating. Uh, how to find the margin of error. Now we've done this a few different ways. Sometimes the uh, Google Sheets allows us to calculate it out using confidence, um, and confidence T. Other times we've had to do it by hand. There's a mixed bag of what people are doing in class. Unfortunately for this one, we are gonna have to do it by hand. So we're gonna need to use this formula. Now the formula for the margin of error is bringing back that Z sub C. And just to remind you that is reflective of our level of confidence. And so that is a Z score. Uh, if you wanna reference the table from chapter eight, section one in a previous video or in the textbook, you will see a list of the commonly used percentages and the Z score that corresponds with that. Uh, and then we're gonna multiply that by the square root of the standard deviation of the first data set divided by the sample size, plus the standard deviation of the second data set divided by its sample size. 
And that is just a reminder as to what those variables represent. So now the next two slides are gonna be addressing two different types of problems. The first one is when sigma or S is given or at least can be found. So again, that is the known standard deviation and a sample standard deviation. Now, if we're just given a list of data, we can find the sample standard deviation. If the population standard deviation were to be known, they would simply say sigma equals blank. Actually, sigma sub one equals blank and sigma sub two equals blank. So they'll actually give us that information. Now, we're going to focus our work on a sample because a lot or all of us, when we collected our 100 data points and then the comparison, those are all samples. So this will be directly applicable to your activity, which is where we're leading with all this stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and read this problem to you. And you will see that it is going to be a little lengthy because they're giving background to give context to the problem, which it's very important to read it because you can't really give your answer without knowing what the problem's talking about. If you were to give me the answer of negative 2.8 to negative 1.4, that doesn't mean anything to me. You would have to say that because it's negative to negative, the second population is better, but that's still not good enough because what does better mean? That could mean that with a 95% level of confidence, we can say that COVID has a higher mortality rate than the flu. That's saying that the second population is better, but in context to the problem. Uh, so we have a study out of the University of Zurich uh, and they tried to figure out if alcohol was a good or a poor sleep aid. Of 29 participants, the first group, N sub one, was 15, and they were given half a liter of red wine before they went to sleep. The second group, which was uh, comprised of 14 participants, were not given any alcohol before they went to sleep. Uh, it was decided to test the participants' brainwave activity between the hours of 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, the logic is, is that if you were to consume alcohol before going to bed, uh, you may fall asleep right away with or without alcohol, but the deciding factor of a restful night's sleep would be, are you waking up before your alarm too early, restless, and unable to get back to bed, or are you sleeping up until your alarm? So that's why they chose the 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., because if you wake up too early, the rest of your day is kind of shot because you're groggy, you might be grumpy, your whole uh, brain is off just because you've now woken up two, maybe three hours before you wanted to. Uh, brain activity is measured in, I'm just guessing just by the company that exists, I'm gonna call this Hertz. I think that's how you pronounce that. Honestly, I didn't look it up, lazy me, I apologize. But uh, anyway, wakefulness is in the range of 16 to 25 Hertz. So if your brain activity is measured at this level, you would be considered awake. Sleep is in the range of four to eight hertz. So if your brain has shut down and you are actively sleeping and resting and in say like a REM sleep or your light sleep or things like that, you would have a brain activity of four to eight hertz. Uh, so we wanna know with a 90% level of confidence, can we say that alcohol is a poor sleep aid? So right there, I've decided which side of the fence I'm on with consuming alcohol. I wanna say that alcohol is a poor sleep aid. Now, in order for that to be true, that would mean that the number of uh, brain activity, the hertz, the, the calculation, the measurement should be larger than the measurement of the no alcohol. So this is what I'm saying here. I think that the brain activity will be higher in the first group who consumed alcohol uh, compared to the group that did not consume alcohol. Now, as I said, we have three possible outcomes. So these are our three possible outcomes. The first one would be if a positive number to a positive number, then we can say that the first population even after subtracting and adding the margin of error was significantly and statistically larger than the second one. So if the first one was larger than the second one, we can say that the first one had a higher level of brain activity 
therefore it is not a good sleep aid. If it was a negative number to a negative number, then that would mean that the second group had the higher brain activity, which would mean that consuming alcohol would be a sleep aid compared to not drinking alcohol. So therefore not drinking alcohol almost prevented a restful sleep. And then if we do a confidence interval and it comes a negative number to a positive number, then we can say that there's no statistical evidence that consuming alcohol will either benefit or hurt your sleep. So it's not necessarily a good or a bad sleep aid. There's no statistical difference. Now I'm gonna jump over to Google Sheets and it's under sheet four in the tab. And we're gonna take a look at the data that's in the book. It's a list of uh, values. So I've already plugged them in. And I'm gonna go through how we would go ahead and calculate this stuff. Uh, so here we go. This is example one, uh, group one, which was 15 people. These are their measurements in Hertz. So that was the brain activity between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m. This is group two. Now, just looking at these two columns, I can see that group two had overall a lower level of brain activity. So I would want to say, in my own opinion, that group two definitely slept better. So therefore, alcohol is not a good sleep aid. Problem with statistics and with math, my opinion doesn't mean anything. Your opinion means nothing as well. The only thing that people care about are the numbers and being able to prove it. So what we have to do is create a confidence interval so that we can say with a certain level of confidence that unbiased, this is what the math says. And maybe we can make the conclusion, maybe we cannot. That's not up to us, that's up to the numbers. So let's go ahead and go through this process. Uh, first, I wanna find the mean of this column of G1. So I'm gonna type in the command of average and I'm gonna go ahead and highlight this column, enter. So they had an average rating of 19.647 Hertz. Standard deviation equals STDEV. Highlight the column, enter give or take 1.86 Hertz. The mean, I'm gonna do the thing. Average of this column and the standard deviation of that same column. All right, so now we have our means, we have our standard deviations. We are now ready to calculate the margin of error and then generate our confidence interval. So the margin of error, as I said, and I can go back to the slide, is that it is going to be our z-score times the square root of the standard deviation divided by its sample size plus the second standard deviation divided by its sample size. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and start calculating that out. Now my z-score is 1.645, so 1.645. And then I'm gonna multiply that by the square root of, and now I have to do each um, standard deviation divided by its sample size. Uh, so I'm going to do this standard deviation divided by the sample size of 15 plus the other standard deviation divided by its sample size of 14 according to the order of operations within those parentheses, Google Sheets will divide and divide, and then it will add it. If you're hesitant on that, you can always add in more parentheses. All right, so I have my margin of error because it's the z-score times the square root of these two, the sum of these two quotients. So now that I know the margin of error, I am now gonna take the difference of these two means, subtract the margin of error, and then I'm gonna take the difference of these two means and add the margin of error and see what I get for values. So I am gonna go ahead and do equals and X bar sub one minus X bar sub two minus the margin of error. I'm getting 12.22. And then I'm gonna do the same thing. I am going to take the X bar sub one minus the x bar sub two plus the margin of error. 
and I'm getting 13.9. So at this point, I can go ahead and make my conclusion. And my conclusion will be, since it's positive to positive, with a 90% level of confidence, consuming half a liter of red wine before bed will result in a higher level of brain activity. Therefore, consuming alcohol is not a sleep aid or is a poor sleep aid. So I was able to state the level of confidence. I was able to say which one was better, what better meant, and just my overall conclusion. So that's what I'm looking for with the interpretation. I'm not gonna be so picky on the homework, but when you do this for your um, 100 sample size, I will be that picky. So we need a good sentence. So I will be looking for them and giving you feedback on the homework, but on your um, assessment for chapter eight, it's going to be implementing this stuff to your information and I will be that picky. So it's good to practice now. All right. Another example, uh, this one is a little more um, common that could happen is that if you're dealing with a probability. Uh, so suppose two groups were having their amount of REM sleep compared. Group one spent one hour watching a comedy movie before bed. Group two didn't watch anything and went straight to bed. Oh, there's a nice typo there. Let's see if we can butcher this. Right to bed. Beautiful. In group one, there were a total of 175 dreams recorded, 49 dreams with feelings of anxiety, fear, or aggression. In group two, there was a total of 180 dreams recorded, which 63 were dreams with feelings of anxiety, fear, or aggression. With a 95% level of confidence, which group, if either, experienced a greater number of dreams with feelings of anxiety, fear, or aggression? So what I'm looking for is the probability of having a negative dream or a nightmare, whatever you want to call it. And I want to know which one had a higher percentage. Now, if group one had the higher percentage, that means that watching a comedy movie would induce greater levels of anxiety, fear, and aggression. If group two had the higher value, then that means that not watching a comedy movie would have a greater chance of having a dream with feelings of anxiety, fear, or aggression. Now, if it went negative to positive, then I do not have enough statistical evidence to conclude that watching a comedy movie or not watching a comedy movie would create greater feelings of anxiety, fear, or aggression, or lower feelings. Uh, now, in order to do this type of problem, we have to find the mean and we have to find the standard deviations. Now, the mean is going to be our probability of success. And what we're going to do is that we're going to subtract the probabilities of success and subtract the margin of error and add the margin of error to create our confidence interval. Uh, so the first thing we'd have to do is figure out what is our probability of succeeding in both instances, and what are these standard deviations. Now, looking up at my values, the first one, I have 49 people that had the feelings of anxiety, fear, or aggression. So I'm going to say I have 49 successes out of 175. And the other one is I have 63 out of 180. So I'm going to go back to my Google Sheets. Uh, here I have my successes and my trials, my successes and my trials. So to find the mean of the first group, I am simply going to divide those numbers. And I get that there is a 28% chance of having a negative dream if you watch an hour of a comedy movie. The next one, I'm going to do 63 divided by 180 there is a 35% chance that you would have a dream of um, anxiety and aggression and all that stuff if you did not watch a comedy movie before bed. Standard deviation. Well, I now know my P. So my P of G1, I know to be 0.28. So that means my Q of G1 must be 
seven two, because that is one minus 28%. And then my P of G two is going to be the 0.35. And my Q of G two is going to be 65%. So now I have my P's and my Q's. Uh, so I am ready to calculate my standard deviations. This is going to be the square root of P times Q divided by 175. So I should expect 28%, give or take about 2.4%. Do that again here. The square root of P times Q divided by, in this case, 180. So I'm just gonna double check, make sure I did this right. Uh, oh, yeah, P, Q, oh, I made a mistake. I thought I did, no, H11. There we go. So H10, H11, and then this one was J10, J11. I thought I made a mistake, I had a hunch. All right, there we go. So now I have the standard deviations, I have the means. Uh, so now I'm ready to calculate the margin of error, which again is the z-score times the square root of the standard deviation divided by the sample size plus, yeah. Okay, so my margin of error, uh, 1.96 is the z-score that corresponds with the 95% times the square root of, and now I'm going to do the first standard deviation divided by the sample size plus the second standard deviation divided by its sample size. And so I have the standard deviation divided by 175, standard deviation divided by 180, enter. So I now have my margin of error. And so to calculate my confidence interval, I'm gonna go ahead and subtract my probabilities of success. So 0.28 minus 0.35 minus my margin of error, enter. I'm getting negative 10.9%, okay? And now I'm gonna do that again, equals my probability of success minus the probability of success plus the margin of error, enter. And go ahead, take this and just drag it over one. There we go. And so I'm getting a negative percent to a negative percent. So I can say with a 95% level of confidence that not watching a comedy movie for an hour before bed would have a greater chance of inducing a dream filled with fears, anxiety, and aggression. So that's how these confidence intervals work. Notice how I didn't say anything about the numbers. I'm strictly looking at is positive to positive, negative to negative, or negative to positive. And give you a couple of problems that will be using this information. Try it out. I apologize for the longer lesson, but it had to happen. My bad. Uh, but try it out and come into Zoom if you have any questions. Good luck.